Thank you for coming. Hi, I'm Bruce Hanley. Um, and, and yeah, thank you for coming. So um, first of all, I just wanted to thank um, Laura Owens and Wendy Yao um, for inviting me to do this event and for hosting the event. Um, I wanted to thank the excellent Ethan Swan for making everything go so smoothly in terms of the build up to the event and for the superb um, GIF he made that went out as the last invite of Sturdivant going, <laughs> hey, 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 um, when she became the Golden Lion. Um, and um, I wanted to thank Hetty L. Colty and Chris Krauss of Semiotext, um, Jessica Koslow of Squirrel, and Charles Babinski and the excellent baristas of GNB for the coffee and tea. And a far away salute to Gavin Brown and his enterprise and to the Lady Sturdivant. And um, of course, directly uh, to my right, Sarah Lehrer Grayer, um, who you I'm sure I'll know from Pet Talk and the Finley Gallery and her great writing from Art Forum and other publications and soon um, to be known for a really superb book on Lee Lozano's Dropout, which will be published by um, After All Books in February. And to my left, Lisa Lipinski, um, one of the most compelling artists in Los Angeles and elsewhere and um, one of Southern California's best teachers, and I've had the pleasure of teaching with Lisa, and I'm so happy she was here today. Um, and she will have a show at Johann Koenig in Berlin in early 2014. So how this is going to run, we want to keep it very casual and hopefully fun and chatty. So I'm going to read the very last section of the book, which is um, uh, short and I think self-contained. And then we're going to have, uh, we're gonna have a conversation um, between the three of us and, um, and then we can get back to music and coffee and tea and cookies, so. Um, so the last um, part of the book is called Reader's Report and it's by Pierre Menard. Marx one-upped Hegel somewhere by pointing out that when the old idealist remarked that all facts and personages of great importance in world history occur as it were twice, he forgot to add the first time as tragedy, the second time as farce. Who am I to argue? Fame is a form of incomprehension, perhaps the worst. But Marx never mentioned that a time might come, vicious circle, when tragedy and farce can no longer be told apart. My so-called demise was overstated, a conceit of the blind homunculus and another of his horde of unreliable librarian narrators. The one tasked with my personal effects laying it on especially thick, on and on and on, describing even the lugubrious cypresses surrounding my grave but it helped the toadying, death always makes good copy, to various baronesses to this and countesses to that, who paid for my corpus to make its way posthumously into print. I just grew so tired of the old author function. 1939, privation had become the world's leitmotif. No one seems ever to have wondered if the narrator, Opit Amanuensis, was actually a hymn, despite the fact that Sylvina Ocampo, a writer of no small repute, knew of all my literary goings-ons and was often their dedicatee, secretly or not. I don't know if it really matters. I just wish that before the enumeration of my visible work, bibliographically exquisite, although pockmarked with strange lacunae, the elusive anonymous whoever hadn't singled out for invective those with Protestant tendencies and the circumcised. Too many have forgotten that the Protestants, Protestants of Nimes sided eventually with the resistance, and I would hate to think that anyone might assume I care less for the circumcised than I do for the uncircumcised. A gift is a gift, wrapped or unwrapped. To write the Quixote was the only way to write what I wished to write. Thinking, analyzing, inventing are not anom anomalous acts. They are the normal respiration of the intelligence. I wanted to test the limits of their inextricability. Which is not to say that what I wished to write or in the end wrote was the Quixote. I never wrote Cervantes' Quixote. 
which has everything to do with why, although verbally identical, some have found mine almost infinitely richer, while others have assumed that my Quixote merely comments on or is about the Spaniard or his famous book. I've always had trouble with about, its ballistics, its certitude. That I should have decided in Neem circa 1939 to tackle chapter 38 of the first part, which treats of the curious discourse that Don Quixote made on the subject of arms and letters, a debate the knight decides against letters and in favor of arms, could not, of course, have had anything to do with polemics, writing at war. With itself were the givens of the situation, my method with camouflage or resistance. Now, where was I? Asked to give my opinion of the author's study of Sturdivant, I don't know. Is it a tragedy or farce that he doesn't ever mention deterritorialization, or expropriation, or premeditation, or unlearning? Forgets to consider Jean Genet's ce qui est resté dans Rembrandt, déchiré un petit carré bien régulier et foutu au chiot, a text published in the Printemps 1967 issue of Tel Quel and delivered in two parallel columns, dual simultaneous parts, textual stand-ins for two cocks frotting on each illegible page. Never claims the plain pleasures of doing something again. The author doesn't really deal with my texts and with the fact that the subject of his study in the late summer of 1970 concluded my work, peerlessly writing into existence parts of my Quixote barely quoted in the fuss budget who'd elected him or herself my scholar work I'd long since abandoned for sun, sea, and surfers, some of whom, I assure you, never surfed a day in their lives. No longer quite subterranean, the ninth and 38th chapters, and the exquisite fragment of chapter 22, Sturdivant, author of the Quixote. To no small degree in making her work mine, she grappled with defiance and its discontents, which results in that curious discourse on letters and arms already mentioned above the epic chapter with, arguably, the Quixote's most famous battle and one on freedom. At the time, hers was not, to put it mildly, the only continuation of politics by other means. Quixotomania perfumed the air, El Topo, by that, for example, by that strange Chilean Jodorowsky. Many called it a Western. And he never does confront the accusatory aspect or force of Sturdivant's doing other people's work which was, I should know, her entree. Instead, he dwells on the inappropriable remains, never quite fathoming what that entails. The inappropriable remains? To start, I mean the grammar of it, goddamn indeterminacy and or contingency of remains. The noun or verb of it boomerangs to smack the inappropriable one way or another, sentence fragment or sentence depending, words identifying a mourning project, those matters beyond human grasp, or a statement about survival, about life, about that which goes on and remains, i.e. the inappropriable. Obviously, author fail. Then again, silence is no less a response than a declaration of love. How do we know when we are really living? All that admitted, I do find it odd the author has nothing to say about Sturdivant's herring tag, 1986. It's not that he didn't do due diligence, wouldn't have tried to talk to herring. He died, not before Sturdivant painted the tag, but long before the author would have possibly had the chance to ask him anything about it. And anyhow, Keith Herring couldn't have told him any more about Sturdivant's herring tag than Cervantes could have elucidated my Quixote. It's that the author, not dealing with it, forgoes the simultaneous tragedy and farce of it, indistinguishable, as well as how it forebodes what of the inappropriable remains. About the size of an LP cover, hazmat orange, uninflected lines of sumi ink loan the tag an extreme precariousness of face. Sumi ink is not actually ink, but a mixture of lamp black, camphor, glue, and soot. The tag smiles wide, wildly, ready for some fun. Eyes bug, brows raised, tongue juts out to lick the square border forming its blockhead. The Mona Lisa de nos jours. So this is the herring tag. Um,
Maybe I'll begin. Um, so there's so much in there that, that connects to a lot of the themes in the book, but first I'd just like to talk about how, or say how wonderful and exciting it was to finish the book with this book review. So what, he, what Bruce just read is a reader's report by Pierre Menard, Pierre Menard being um, the Pierre Menard of Borges, and this is such a Borgesian gesture to end the book with a book review, and immediately as the book ends, kind of you're beginning again. The cycle continues. It's kind of pointing. Uh, it, it really feels like it's pointing forward and into the future immediately from the moment the book ends, like, which also seems to talk about the role of the critic as the first responder or something. Um, and that you end with this Keith Haring tag, which then brings us back again to the very beginning, to the cover of the book. So it's this looping that happens, which is um, really connected to this idea throughout that's Janice-headed of an action, a, a piece of writing, or a gesture in one's art practice that uh, reaches both to the past and to the future to make a change that is going in both directions that changes everything that came before it, recontextualizes everything that came before it, and sets a new uh, ground for what comes after. So I guess that that idea, um, there's so many places that that could go, but makes me want to ask you about this idea of the long term and um, a long term project or practice, both yours and Sturdivant's, but how important it is that this book happened over a decade that, um, Sturdivant explicitly clarifies that her decision to make her work the work of others was, quote, long-term and reflective uh, and not <clears throat> flippant in any way. So I've been thinking about this <coughs> issue of the long-term study and in contradistinction to our, the current dominance of the short-term, um, the hyperlink kind of thinking, not only in our own kind of modes of taking in information, but just on a national policy level, everything seems to be very short-term oriented. And, I, and there's a lot of reasons for that, and it makes sense, but it's something to, uh, your long-termness uh, points to the problems of that, and there are polemics throughout this, so that just seems like one of many. But so this issue of the long-term, both in Sturdivant's practice and in your production of this book, I'm thinking about the nature of thinking of a subject over a decade, how sustaining something changes one's relationship to it, the deep research that happens over this long span of time, um, and how the studying of a subject also changes you as the person studying. That's a lot. <laughs> um. The first time I wrote on Sturdivant was uh, for Freeze, and I published an essay on in 2000. And what's strange about that is at that point, Sturdivant had been making work for over 40 years, but that was, except for an article in the Japanese art journal, Bijitsu Teko, um, in 1967, it was the first and only magazine feature on her ever. Um, there were interviews in magazines, short interviews with her in magazines, but um, it was the first kind of, and there were catalog essays, but those are different things. Um, and so on some level, that's how I got to know Sturdivant. And uh, you know, there's, it's, that has something to do with the strangeness of the, I think of working on her and that for an artist of her generation and her generation is I mean, to make it most quickly, her generation is that of Jasper Johns and Rauschenberg, even though she's associated with, um, I think, pop artists, if people know about her, although the New York Times, courtesy of Thea Westreich, called her pictures generation artist, which has <laughs> made me laugh. Um, Fact-checking to the rescue. Um, so, um, so, uh, so there's that, and you know, in 2000, um, certain things were not around yet that change, I think, her, most of her video work um, was just beginning, so it makes, and that makes her a very different artist, and the work behind us is 
a kind of illicit single channel version of a multi-channel work which was uh, made in 2010 um, and first shown for her a uh, large survey curated by Anne Dresden at um, the Museum of Modern Art um, of Paris. And um, no, that's wrong. That's totally wrong. I'm thinking of Finite Infinite. This is from 2011, I think, and was first shown at the Venice Biennale um, and then at Gavin Brown's. So, but anyway, uh, getting off track. Uh, <laughs> So her work became different, and the understanding of her work became different, and um, our country became um, uh, even more frontally, brutally militarized in the decade that I was writing of the book, which synchronized with, you know, as was said during, has been said many times, it, I didn't need to say it, you know, a kind of second Vietnam effect. Um, uh, and so that changed the dynamic and the tenor of the book. And um, I also, you know, uh, I don't know if I'll write another book like this. I can't imagine it at this point. Um, but I really had thought about what I rarely felt when I was reading books about art and how there just to seem to be the possibility of doing more with what that book could sound like and how it could operate. And so, you know, I said to you, I think earlier in the week, it's like, I'm totally happy if someone takes this as a beach read. I mean, it's like, what could be higher praise of like reading this on the beach? Um, and there, I really tried to work both with the archive, but then at a certain point, which demands a certain kind of attention, but then you know, the middle of the book, which operates like a script for a play, I really wanted to be, like, it's not footnoted because plays aren't footnoted and it talks about right now in a way that I was trying to engage history in the other parts of the book. And so that took a long time to figure out. I, I you know, there were a lot of false starts and the nice, the great thing about eventually working with Semiotext is that it came very much later in the process. I did not know, I'm so happy I got to work with them, but I certainly did not know when I started the project that this is where the book, or how the book would show up, so. Yeah, and that in that duration, which you're already starting to talk about, but that the in the book there are pretty dramatic style shifts in the writing and that the duration of working on it could allow that to happen and um, for you to cycle through different voices and uh, genres and even rule them out that don't even ever make it into the book so much writing that never that doesn't end up appearing here yeah like Twitter <laughs> I was convinced that at a certain point a whole part of the book had to be written in precise 140 character t tweets and I, and then another part I really wanted to be like, uh, it's like great Hilton Al's kind of piece on PJ Harvey, which is a single long sentence. And he bases his wanting, I mean, part what he talks about at the beginning of the piece, this Donald Bartleby story called Story, which is a single long sentence about a divorce. And that was <laughs> Totally beyond me. You got close. Um, I got close. Got there were some close. nice There's long some sentences, long sentences but, yeah. but it was <laughs> like there were lots of things that were just like, yeah, that's not going to happen so, <laughs> anymore. And it took a long time to figure that out. So, no. Um, my first question, and this is just sort of going back to the beginning of the book, and it's kind of shifts a little bit. Is that okay? Yeah, or? maybe talk. Okay. Oh, yeah. And so it's about um, Oldenburg's anger towards mm. her. And, um, you know, I was in the bookstore and I was like, there was a Kusama biography on the bookshelf. And I, you know, picked it up because a lot of my undergraduate students are very into Kusama. And I thought, oh, that, now I hear myself. <laughs> okay. Um, I thought, okay, I want to just pick this up and look through it. So I pick it up and I look through it. And the, the first thing I see is um, she's telling a story about how after Oldenburg did his first soft sculptures, um, he, oh, he, he, she saw Oldenburg's wife, Kusama saw Oldenburg's wife, and Oldenburg's wife apologizes to her. And I sort of flip, <laughs> flip through a little, I'm just standing there, flip through again, 
and she's telling the story about how Warhol telephones her and asks if she, he can use her patterns to, um, in his silk screens, which she says no to. Her, and this is right after, like in 1963, mm -hmm. right after the aggregation mm -hmm. thousand boat show. And she says no, and then something like, you know, Warhol got his repeti repetition from me, I got my repetition from my childhood. <laughs> <laughs> flip through a little further and um, flip through a little further and she's like talk, she's describing this happening that she had at her studio where these Japanese businessmen show up and they molest the people in the um, in the happening and so her her solution to it is is to make a sign that says no Japanese <laughs> and put it outside her studio <laughs> flip a little further and this is the last thing I look at and she um, and this is not like things I'm picking out. This is just like the, this is just like the, the what I just <laughs> saw standing there, and um, and she's talking about meeting Cornell at a at a train station mm -hmm. or something, and how he despises all gallerists and dealers. <laughs> and it's not like you know like one has done something bad. It's like you can like you can despise like lawyers who represent envir you know environmental polluters or something. Like you could look at them as like a whole gang. <laughs> But then I just thought it was just so strange, like this, like parallels, like mm. the way, like Warhol asking to use the patterns for his silk screens, and then, you know, Sturdivant asking to use his actual screens, yeah. or then Oldenburg's wife apologizing for basically, of course, it has to be for like you know, kind of stealing an mm -hmm. idea, right? And then him being so angry when she, and I guess the quote she uses is that he wants to kill her when she recreates yeah. the store. Door, she drives store events, the wall or something. Yeah. Store. <laughs> and I was thinking, okay, but there's a real question in here. Mm -hmm. And I, but, and then I was thinking, well, then I came to it was like, oh, like, why, why was Oldenburg so mm -hmm. angry? Like, okay, so he had to, she hurt him in some way, right? Mm -hmm. It's about, and like, how, how was he hurt? I mean, it seems like really, Okay, think about that for one second. I'm supposed to say that a green Subaru is blocking the neighbor's driveway. Can the owner please move it? Okay. That was that. Okay. Uh, business getting done. So, um, Oldenburg's anger. Well, um, and criminality. And Maybe criminal that gets to like her criminality. Yeah, I mean, the first thing is Sturdivant does not ask permission. Um, she knew almost all the artists. She whose work she was making in the 60s and in the 70s. Um, and so, I mean, the strange thing is that Oldenburg was this big supporter of hers, and she says that. Like she, was, she participated in one of his big happenings in 1965, or yeah, I think early in 65. But, um, I mean, Oldenburg's, Oldenburg's a fiendish guy at times. I mean, Chris Krauss has written really well about his utter uh, abuse on some level, on a career level, of Hannah Wilkie and um, her work. Uh, He's a difficult figure, um, and I think his anger was probably, I don't think there was one reason mm -hmm. that he would have been angry with her, and, but one of them must have been that under the, that, that she was going to do this around the block from where he had done it, and she had probably certainly not asked his permission to do it. And that it was sanctioned by, on some level, Rauschenberg and Steve Paxton and another group of artists. And it's also not clear, like, because of the aggression before that event opens immediately, it, it on some level, there's a reprisal without him having ever to do something, so he can remain angry. But on some level, this continues. Like, I know when I contacted the Oldenburg estate to see if there were photographs of um, Sturdivant in his happenings, or, or just even 
uh, candids of them together. I had, you know, dates and specific performances and stuff like this and, you know, would try over the course of like two years, every three months or so, writing the gallery. And they were like, there are no, there are no photographs. You, we don't know why you would think there were photographs. Um, and then when Art Forum's photo editor tried either different channels or different person or because of Art Forum or whatever, all of a sudden photographs appear. And so this is, this is part of, I mean, I don't know if it's simply anger, but it's certainly a, 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 at times severe career management and any thing that he sees as not being sanctioned, he will not sanction. And I think, you know, on some level, Sturdivant has never returned to that work. I mean, there's certain artists who she repeats, like Warhol is the one person whose work she repeats in every decade of her career. And then there are other artists who are like important for a particular moment and then are never, you know, she never returns to them. And that's also like, like why should that be? Why should certain people return and other people's not? But it, it probably has something to do with uh, the difficulty of the relationship to begin with. And you know, I talked to Patty Mucha, who is his his first wife, was his first wife, and certainly makes um, made so much of the work. And her own take on Sturdivant is at best ambivalent. Like she is careful to say that she's like, I don't, you know, doesn't, did, I think this is a career of hiding. I don't know she's ever explored, like, who she is. You know, that's not my take, but it's someone who is around the scene, another woman who is around the scene, and that is her take. And uh, certainly I listen to it. You know. Yeah, well, I mean, that, so, well, that brings up this, the issues of criminality and hiding in plain sight, which, Sturdivant does, but actually before we get to that, I, th I think that something you had mentioned before that, so Oldenburg is angry in a way that, like, his anger, this is for Sturdivant remaking the store, how yeah. much after? So um, she makes his store uh, uh, roughly within three blocks of where his store was, and his store is, the final version of it is I think 62, 63. So she's doing it roughly four to five years after he has done it. So his anger, I mean, in a way, it, w it would be understandable if almost every artist that she did this to would be angry in that way. Which gets to something that you talked about, like, this is something that she can do, and a kind of committing an act, an, uh, an art act, in a way that is not unlike a crime in a certain ways, that um, she can do or that it's possible to do because she's a woman in a way, that, that this practice may not have been able to be possible if she had been a man working at that time and trying, and like a man, a male artist copying Oldenburg would have been a very, the dynamics would, would have been different and I know something you've thought about. Yeah, I mean, I wanna be careful about that kind of question, but I do think, you know, the case can be made that in terms of her repetitions her making other people's work, uh, you know, for those, like, I'm quite clearly, you know, she's, I think, by many people thought only to have done men, you know, now that the book is out. <laughs> she, I mean, she made a piece and performed a piece in public of Yvonne Rayner. She made work by Nikki de saint fall um, which, to the best of my knowledge, is destroyed. She made pieces in the 90 by Dominic Gonzalez Forster. Um, I don't think that we can any longer say, like she will be clear, it's like, like you know, gender is not part of my thinking. Um, and I think, you know, she, sh her first show as Sturdivant and for the work that she's known for is at the Bianchini in 65, and it's not too long after that Lee Lozano has her two shows, and they're very different artists, but it's a curious and at times helpful twinning that, um, that they maneuvered in the way they maneuvered in part because of the just givens of the scene, which were many artists, uh, of the many artists who were becoming famous and 
beginning to earn money from this, they, most of them were not women. And um, even the most supportive could still be, I mean, I think people thought at first that Sturdivant was just being funny. Right, I think that, you know, that seems like, like the key of it, this issue of like, which is a bone that's being picked throughout, like what gets taken seriously and what doesn't, and when and by who, and who gets taken seriously, and in general that it's, you know, we can come down on the side, on a certain side of that position, like who should be taken seriously, or that it's up to us who gets taken seriously, but what's nice about this, what, the, what we're talking about right now is that there might be actually a benefit at a certain point of not being taken seriously, that you can get away with certain things and um, kind of slip under the radar and, you know, there's a time lag and that's totally, with her long-term strategies, totally built into the work, but uh, that it allows things in the present that will only become visible or known or recognized in a future, but not being taken seriously might not be all bad. No, I mean, no, I think she used it as the greatest strength. And she constantly, I mean, like, you know, it's so, it's a really wonderful experience that Sturdivant, you know, in certainly in Europe at this point is a kind of rock star and she's being recognized. I mean, her, but her first, her only American museum solo show was in 1973. There's never been another one. And it was not in New York City. It was in upstate New York at the Everson in Syracuse. And, you know, she will have a show at MoMA in New York next year. And that's amazing and thrilling. And, um, but there were many years where no one cared. The first time I went out in public with her, you know, in the early 2000s, no one, want, no one knew who she was, no one wanted to meet her, no one wanted to shake her hand, and, you know, the funniest thing at the Gavin Brown opening when she showed this piece um, was the long line of people, many of them in their 20s, were like, you're my favorite artist. It's like, Wow, that's a change. Um, and you know, that has to do with like being taken seriously and the whole system that, you know, and that by system I mean writers, dealers, collectors, um, journalists, art historians, how they come, how these things synchronize yeah. to determine in any given moment, and of course these this things like this change, sometimes you know, up and down repeatedly, or sometimes you have a moment and then forgotten for a long time, um, that it, it, it's never, it's only something that the artist, him or herself, can control to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. And then it's just like, I'm gonna keep doing what I, what motivates me and excites me to do this, and I'm gonna go forward. And, you know, early on, after I had written about her, but was getting to know her, she's like, I never doubted my own project, and, uh, but I also knew that I was going to have to just stop explaining. I just had to go do the work, and that would take care of itself. And, you know, it's a happy, happy uh, thing that a lot of people like the work now. <laughs> uh, because that doesn't always happen for so many people. Yeah. It just doesn't. This non, the not taken seriously continues until after their death. And then all of a sudden, they're super serious and important. Lozano um, is the per, you know is is a really good example, and yeah. by no means the only one. You know. um, the thing is that almost like heartbreaking though is that is the how she is like not taken seriously by like the people of her generation. Yeah. It's it's like you almost have to like piece together these threads. <laughs> like this, she's in a picture with Rauschenberg. <laughs> she wrote a letter to Yvonne Rayner when she was sick. And it's like the whole thing, it's like these, th and it's like you can imagine, like for instance, that letter from you know, to Yvonne Rayner, you end with it. You can imagine the same letter, it's to Yvonne Rayner, Yvonne Rayner and like Yvonne Rayner, is, someone's writing a book on Yvonne Rayner, like it would not get even get in the book. It would not even, like it would be nothing. No. But it becomes like, because it's <laughs> it, these like small, and Duchamp wrote her three sentences, you know? He no. came for 10 seconds to her <laughs> show. It's just like, it becomes so, so, and then like when Yvonne Rayner doesn't even remember, she redid her performance, it's like, you wanna burst into tears. Like, you know, how can you not remember? Like how, you, so there, and so there's like this like lightness and like not, this, yeah, it's just like. Well, I mean, the, you know, the, as Pierre Menard says, you know, it's like, is it tragedy or farce? And how do you how do you tell the difference between those two things? Because on another, you know, I totally, I mean, I 
Um, you know, the funny thing about the letter to Yvonne Rayner is it really did not have any meaning. It was no. in, it's in the Getty. And you end the, no, the, the thing about <laughs> Bruce. <laughs> it's, you know, the funny thing about that letter is like, it's in, it was great for me, but it like, I'm going like, st trying to piece together what this Yvonne Rayner piece was and Sturdivant herself will not tell me because she doesn't think it's that interesting and it's so long ago and why could I possibly be interested in this and I should be writing about her new videos and you know I constantly had to keep telling her it's like well without understanding what you actually did in the 60s and the 70s and part of the 80s and the 90s how could we possibly talk about these videos like what how would we know what they are She's like, ah, oh, I think you should just forget that early stuff. I, you know, so, but anyway, so I, you know, I'm trying to piece together this Yvonne Rayner thing, and, um, and so I go to the Getty because they have Rayner's archives, and I'm like, okay, I think she, she was working on this piece here. I'm just gonna look, start going through files here, and I get to this stack of like condolence letters, not condolence letters, like get well letters. And I'm going was through them. That was a category? There was like a, a, category, <laughs> a category of like of that, of, of, of organization. <laughs> and I go through them and I see Sturdivant's handwriting and I see this letter signed Elaine. They have no idea who the Elaine is. I had no idea who the Elaine is. They don't care who the Elaine is. Yvonne Rayner, when she put it there, doesn't care who the Elaine is. Um, and that is part of, I can tell you now that is categorized if you like, you can look for it. You can use their database and find it because once you want to publish a picture of that letter, they take great care in like whose letter it is um, and how you know this. Um, but, um, you know, that was part of the detective novel aspect of doing this like writing it, but also, and wanting to kind of perform that in the writing as best I could, but also part of the fun of like, you didn't know and couldn't know where you might find something that to my project was key and to most other people just, it meant nothing. And, um, and that's the switch I think we're talking about. I mean, like with the basic element of her work is like, you look at this and see a Warhol drawing or you or Warhol painting or you look at this and you see Oldenburg's store and then it's not that it's like why do you why do you care about those kinds of differences and how do you care about those kinds of differences and how long it can take someone to figure out why they might care mm -hmm. because if you only care about how it looks which is a great thing to care about you're I mean it's it looks like something else I mean you know I don't know. I don't know if I answered the question. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, there's so much like astounding research in this book. It's like really exciting and it does feel like a detective novel at parts. It's just and and that whole aspect which having uh recently been in a headspace of trying to write <laughs> yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Um uh it it seemed or what made me really happy too is how again like the length that this thing takes but the research that happens the, the the total unpredictable contingencies of how history gets written and what gets remembered or not because it's 40 years later it's totally understandable that Rainer wouldn't yeah. remember you know like we can resent it but it's also like how many people was she in course yeah. so like there's such like really unnervingly unpredictable de contingencies and all these things are actually what end up constituting history that gets written down and what we end up remembering or not and also that part of that would be you know with Sturdivan I'm not sure exactly how this works but with Lozano it's maybe like I, I I've thought about it more but that certain things remain private and they remain private like deliberately, there's a there's like a thought there, and not everything gets exposed, and that's as important as what does get exposed. But that I really feel like you're tracking that process of how history gets written with all these factors at play that are uh, really hard to get a handle on, or to it's just such a human product, and like who you happen to talk to and who happens to remember something or like going through an archive and finding this thing that's totally not cat like cataloged uh, 
and that happens more than once in the book. Um, yeah. Well, I think it's it's this question, you know, what determines what gets categorized as work by an artist at all, and what's recognized. What's recognized, and you know, we we live in this moment, which you know, for better or for worse, anything goes. The truly anything goes, and it seems to, you know, I, it's. It seems to be depend, a certain kind of dominant mode depends upon celebrity involvement on some level. And that is, you know, there's, that's good or fine or that's where we are. And to like, to, there's a certain point of like, well, if, you're, if you don't like the way that that is, then find a way to undo that um, or find a different mode of thinking or something like that and it's it's part of her project is well repetition allows you one way to just go to the heart of it yeah. like it like it a kind of hands on way of saying what is this if i make this is it the same how is it the same is it different how is it different and that um causes chronologically problems. I mean, just like in terms of like providing a chronology. And, you know, part of the book, the book is not a biography, you know, and I didn't want it to be a biography. And there's a really amazing biography to be written. It's not gonna be written by me. Um, and um, that also seemed in terms of a moment in which the persona of the mm. artist is so dominating that it was really salubrious for my own thinking to think about someone who thwarted that yeah. deeply for decades. Yeah, the whole practice seems to, on one level, be a meditation about that, or making your own work, the work of other people, hiding in someone else's brain or something, in someone else's work, which, you know, is interesting in and of itself anyway as a long-term project, but seems particularly poignant now in an age of like crazy hyperbolic celebrity, but also diffused like Twitter, uh, you know, whatever, anyone can like shit their stuff out for everyone to see. Um, but yeah, that, I mean, maybe that also, well, actually, I don't, I don't know if you wanted to, I don't want to commandeer, but um, this, uh, like, th th this thing of, like, uh, doing other people's work, and which you talk about at one point as the eye gets over itself, like, as invested as we are in a subjective experience of consciousness and what it's like to be in our own brains, how important it is to get outside of that and to get to transcend mere, you say, like, mere self-identification, which her practice is so much about. Um, and which to me the flip side of that is this kind of act of radical empathy uh, that each of these gestures that she does by remaking a Johns or remaking the Warhol or the Boys or the Duchamp but it still feels like really potent as, a, as an act of radical empathy um, yeah I've just been thinking a lot about that I mean um, and that too, I guess, that feels like a polemical position or statement that the book is staking out. Well, I mean, we've talked, uh, and I, you know, I th I'm really interested in, I mean, I think I was on some level intuitively, but like in terms of giving it a kind of uh, intellectual structure. I'm really interested in T.J. Clark's writing about modesty and the local and that utopia at this moment seemingly is never going to come and that means you have to look at making change on a kind of microtonal local level and um, and that you can have radical effect but it's not going to be instantly, like the very parent, the very kind of technology that we live in can make everything instantly everywhere. But there might be 
things which can operate by another means and that the other that you save may be just a single person or the other that you engage might or whose words you repeat importantly might be you know just next door or the reader that you encounter or something like that and that seems really exciting to me it's you know uh it's and it can be like a time released drug I mean, I think that's right. how I think about a lot of Sturdivant's practice. It's like, this is time released. It, it, it entered the world, certain people knew about it, certain people ignored it, decades forgot about it, and then it comes back like this boomerang or like this pill, that, that this hit of something, and it gives you a flashback that you maybe didn't want and didn't ask for and fucks with your head, and I find that thrilling like really thrilling. Um, and I'm never not thrilled by the woman who put that into motion. It's like, wow. I mean, the, one of the funniest, sweetest things is a, a artist, a friend of hers who knew her in the 80s. When I talked to him, he was like, you know, you don't, you can't have any doubts about why you should be doing this project. And I was like, oh, that's why, why do you say that? And she, he was like, he was very sly and witty, but he was like, well, she only made great work. And, right. and, um, and I love that idea. <laughs> it's just yeah. like, I mean, I know how much work there is that she's destroyed. So that's, I mean, on some level, not true, but I totally got what he was saying. It's like, don't, don't doubt your own project. It's like, she made great work and all the complications of what that means. Right, and right. I love that, so. Um, I have a question about um, technique. Sorry, Go I feel ahead. like I'm coming. Techne. <laughs> <laughs> Poesis and techne. Um, and it's just, I don't, it's, we're sort of like earlier talking about like this sort of, this sort of lightness, like pulling, you know, that, you know, pulling these very small things together you know, trying to track, you know, her relationship to these, her peers and, and just like looking for threads almost. And, and so I was thinking, do you think that in Sturdivant's work that like technique is, do you think, look at it as heavy or do you look at, think, look at it as light? And this is what I mean by this. It's like, I sometimes like when I used to look at that work before I knew that much about it, that, um, it seems so heavy to me. Like, like other people like look at it in this like really weightless way, you know. Like it's just like, oh, she remade Oldenburg. She remade, you know, Warhol gave her the screens, and she remade this, you know, she remade Warhol. Like if someone told me to remake Warhol's store, like I could do it by like 2020 or something. Like I'd be, oh my god. And and if we had like, and then it's another, t you know, technique. You know, it's like, oh my god, a whole another set of techniques I have to learn to 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 like. To, to create the next thing. It's like always like a new, and it's, to me that just feels like there's like a, a heaviness in a way for me personally, but then I think, oh, it's also a lightness. Like you just like pick it up and you just do the next one. Then you just pick, uh, techniques are just there to like pick up and, and to leave and to pick up again or something. And so. Well, I love that you talk, that you, that you spend a moment in the book to emphasize the image in the reader's mind of Sturdivant in her studio and how important that is, that it's and practice. that it's not just a conceptual gesture, but that the going, the following through of it is essential, and is part of that like radical empathy of that by making someone else's work, you can figure out how it was made. And or, also, you know, it's a design project, like in a weird way. It's like, I've kept, it kind of like um, occurred to me when she remade the, bra the Dada bracelet mm -hmm. for Duchamp, and I was thinking, oh, she has to like, yeah. so it's like this work that Duchamp proposed but never made, and he was like, thought they'd make some money with it, <laughs> and, and, but then I was like, okay, if you had to do that, you'd have to like find out like, the topography, and you'd like, where you would get the, where would you get it made, and then like how many, you know, it's just, like, it's just, like, I was trying to, I was thinking of all the, yeah. all the, the things to make, the, and then, then you'd send it to Duchamp, which would be a whole other kind of thing to actually do that, you know, like to actually, to, to, to like get yourself to send it to Duchamp. <laughs> and, and I was thinking, oh, she has to design that bracelet. And then, 
And then I was thinking, oh wait, like she, even though like the bracelet's not made, right? Like, but the other words are, the other works are made. The Oldenburg store, store is made. She has to design Oldenburg store. I was like, she's a designer. And if I was like teaching a class on intro to design, I would start with Sturdivant. <laughs> like, like, like well, that is like where study. she should be. Yeah, I, yeah, I, th I think, you know, the, the thing that is so much of the early work she put in as she titled it study of so it's study of Yvonne Rayner's three seascapes. It's the study of Walter De Maria's shit drawings. It's the study of, and that goes both ways. I mean, it's like the study is usually, especially in drawing, the thing that comes before. So it's this preemptive or the thing you do before you finalize the project. But it's also, I think, really importantly, a study, i.e., I'm going to take on trying to figure out what this thing is. I am going to be beholden to this. And I think in the, the possibility of art being bigger than any one person and something that you could be beholden to, it opens up a lot of possibilities. I mean, in this kind of paradoxical way. Like, she found a kind of liberty through this beholdenness, this study of. But also the study could be then, in the way that a study can be, kind of finite. Not the grand study of like, she can't do a study of herself, that's, you know, that, but that happens through the work. But this notion of, you know, she talks about when she, you know, really started making these drawings in the 80s of like, teaching herself how to draw, like a lot of them were Lichtenstein drawings. And she had done Lichtenstein works before, but never drawings, or not as many drawings. And that being something like, that she just liked to do too. I mean, I don't, I think the heaviness, I think there's a heaviness there of like, what does it mean? Like when, I know with the black Stella paintings, it's only until she found or could determine what he was putting into the paint to make it look, move the way it moved, that she could make those works. Like, they just, it's not just like you can go to this, even though yeah. he talks about, you know, you can't get the paint any better, what it is, the, can, the paint's as good as it is on, out of the can or fresh out of the can. It's like, mm, no, that's actually not right. And so you figure out what's weird about this act of technique or this uh, beholdenness to someone else's process is it, goes both ways, I mean like where it goes forward and backward, it changes something that must have been going on that maybe no one has looked at in the other artist's work. Like, oh, he's not taking this straight out of the can. Or if he's taking it straight out of the can, that kind of paint, the way that different kinds of film in our world have been made obsolete, is no longer made. So if you wanted to do this, how would you do it now? And it makes it obviously, you know, this is part of it, like completely different. Um, and that ha is by struggling with that kind of question. I think it's strange, it never comes up in the book at any point like that anyone ever like sort of questioned like whether she did a good job. Mm. No, that, no, the critics have said that. Like I know like Roberta Smith has some line in a review of, of one of her Jasper Johns. It's not a very convincing Jasper Johns. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I guess so. I don't know what, I mean, it's like, yeah, no, that? it doesn't. It's not a John's, so why would it have? I mean, you know, I get yeah. what she's saying, but like, but no, the artists, I think, got it. I mean, the artists who got her really, I think, loved it. But, and you know, and they do operate differently. Like this, the the Warhols, they are on, on some level they're Sturdivant, and at the same time, because it's his screen. Like he got that. He got it more than anyone else. Like how this wasn't a Warhol, but used his screen anyway, so. I love that it's also like a conservator's project then too, that she knows these works better than anyone else other than the artist, and yeah. like how they were made and what materials and how to fix them, or I mean, because I remember taking a course on conservation with Carol Mancusi Ungaro, who's like this big conservator at the Whitney, and she described that for working on Pollock, that she had to, tr that she tried to remake a Pollock mm -hmm. to figure out how this material acts in this way and how you could deal with it as a conservator, but that that's happening in this too, yeah. yeah. Should we let that be it? If you last question, to. one last question. 
Oh, there's so many. <laughs> but thank you, everyone, for coming. And, um, and um, have a good weekend. So. <laughs>